we've said to uh, also to Indonesia that um, in the current co uh, context, we will find it very, very difficult uh, to engage uh, with Russia in the G20 context. So, Halo Sobat Medcom, ketemu lagi di Newsmaker, medcom.id, obrolan hangat one-on-one -on -one bersama saya Alfa Mandalika. Indonesia terkena getah perang Rusia dan Ukraina. Sebab sebagai pemegang presidensi G20, Indonesia menjadi ajang tarik-menarik negara anggota G20 yang pro dan kontra kehadiran Presiden Rusia Vladimir Putin di KTT G20 Bali akhir tahun ini. Nah sangat menarik untuk mendalami reaksi keras negara-negara anggota G20 pada Indonesia, khususnya sikap anggota G20 yang juga anggota NATO atas kedatangan Putin ke Bali. Jurnalis Medcom ID, Marcella secara eksklusif telah mewawancarai Duta Besar Uni Eropa, Vincent Piquet, untuk mengetahui seperti apa sikap resmi Uni Eropa atas konflik Rusia dan Rusia, serta, se serta sikap Uni Eropa setelah Indonesia mengundang Putin ke Bali. Dan inilah Newsmaker pekan ini. Ambassador, uh, we all know about the situation now in Ukraine. So, what do you think about the situation there, and what has the European Union done regarding this crisis? Yeah, European Union uh, sees this uh, um, invasion by Russia of U Ukraine as uh, the the most serious uh, security. Uh, crisis we have uh, witnessed in Europe uh, ever since the Second World War. And uh, you talk uh, about something that happened 70 years ago. Um, this is a massive uh, military um, attack against a sovereign country. Uh, it was unprovoked uh, by anything. Um, it was illegal. It is incompatible with Uh, Russia's uh, obligations as a member of the United Nations. Uh, there was no threat coming from Ukraine at all that could in any way have uh, justified uh, this attack. So uh, we consider it very serious for uh, the, um, the law and rule-based order uh, in Europe, but um, by extension also in, in, in the world, because at the end of the day, Uh, Russia is a member of the uh, a permanent member of the um, UN Security Council. It is a nuclear power, uh, as such, it has um, uh, special responsibilities uh, to accept and to observe, and we don't see that happen at all. Um, so, what have we done about it as EU? Um, first of all, already before the crisis, uh, the invasion happened. Uh, we've done tremendous amount of diplomatic outreach um, uh, to try and avert uh, the uh, uh, this this invasion. Uh, it was unsuccessful. Um, the invasion happened. Uh, we have, uh, uh, of course, expressed uh, in all platforms uh, of the UN, in particular, and elsewhere, uh, our strong support for Ukraine's um, territorial integrity. We have um, dismissed as totally unacceptable uh, the attack, and um, and we have, um, together with uh, 140 countries uh, from around the globe, uh, there's not just East versus West, but 140 members of the United Nations um, voted two resolutions uh, in the past weeks uh, to um, strongly, strongly uh, deplore uh, this uh, invasion and to ask Russia to uh, cease fire and to withdraw its, uh, its, uh, its troops from, uh, from Ukrainian soil unconditionally. So diplomatic action is one. Secondly, uh, we have uh, extended a lot of financial support to uh, the Ukrainian government, um, 1.2 billion euros. So a massive amount of money for uh, the government to basically run, keep the country running, to keep uh, the salaries paid and to um, help the government uh, to provide humanitarian and social help. Uh, that's one. Uh, secondly, um, 
the EU has done something that we've never done before, and that is provide military uh, equipment assistance, the, the equipment of a defensive nature uh, to uh, enable uh, Ukraine uh, to defend itself against uh, uh, the uh, military aggression from, uh, from, uh, from Russia. And lastly, what we've done is, of course, we've reached out to the Ukrainian uh, citizens and to the many people, millions and millions of people, the numbers now go towards the 10 million uh, Ukrainian citizens who are dislocated inside uh, their country uh, or who have uh, had to flee uh, their country, uh, especially to, uh, to Europe. Um, and the numbers now are about 3 million Ukrainian refugees who have sought shelter in, in Europe. Um, Europe has said immediately, uh, we are open uh, to Ukrainian citizens uh, fleeing the war. Uh, we will accommodate you. We will provide you with shelter, with the medical aid. Uh, you can find jobs. You can uh, put your children in schools, uh, etc. Uh, uh, at least for one year, and but maybe uh, longer if needed. We hope not. So that is a tremendous humanitarian offer that we've made. Some of our member states, uh, the ones that neighbor on Ukraine, um, there are five of them, Poland, uh, Hungary, Slovakia, uh, Romania, and uh, Bulgaria. Of course, they have a tremendous, tremendous inflow of refugees to manage. Um, and their commitment and the solidarity that they show is, is absolutely fantastic. The government level, but also the citizens. Uh, but they stand, don't stand alone. Uh, we have a a system uh, inside the EU for sharing the burden and uh, the humanitarian burden out among all the member states. And that's what we see take shape now. So that is what we are busy doing. Okay, Ambassador, uh, you said about the uh, refugees because the refugees already uh, go to uh, flee to uh, EU, EU, EU countries. So there are any guarantees from EU to protecting the Ukrainian refugee? Yes, uh, 100%. Uh, that's what we, are, we have stated at the, at the top level, uh, our heads of states have said that uh, Ukrainian refugees will find shelter without distinction, whether you, wherever you come from, uh, uh, you will find sh shelter in, in Europe uh, from, from this, uh, this aggression and uh, lead a safe life uh, for as long inside the EU for as long as it is needed. The European Union has announced we'll di discuss uh, about the Ukraine membership. Has there been a decisions about that? And uh, if Ukraine be a part of the EU, uh, will there any help for Ukraine in terms of military? Uh, first of all, uh, the, the EU leaders have indeed said to Ukraine, you will be welcome in the EU and you will uh, become a member state. Um, this is not easy, of course. This, uh, it's not uh, joining a, 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 a gym or a, or a tennis club and you pay and you play. Um, there's, it is about becoming part of an integrated economy, an integrated society, so uh, we have to prepare that very well. Um, at the same time, we know the urgency uh, of the matter. Uh, this, this is an unprecedented situation. And so there is a political commitment from the EU leaders to, to reach out to Ukrainian citizens and to the Ukraine um, government uh, by offering uh, this perspective of, uh, of, of membership. Uh, second uh, question you ask um, about uh, military uh, uh, assistance. Um, bear in mind that the EU is not a military alliance. It's a, an alliance of uh, states that together have built a an integrated and united Europe in the economic terms, in social terms, in political terms. And we have over time also developed a, a defense um, a cooperation amongst the member states, but we do not have an army. And um, the main objective of our organization is not to, not to build one. But uh, at the same time, in our treaty, there is a, um, a clause uh, uh, whereby member states have said, uh, we will protect one another in case of a crisis, 
and um, and so uh, that is looking into the future but uh, that is definitely a uh, a commitment that for, for any member state um, uh, to observe towards other member states um, in, in what as and when um, the country is inside the eu okay i we, can't hear you yes sorry <laughs> we move to the next questions uh eu countries are among this the, those that uh, have also imposed some sanctions on Russia, apart from the war, from the war, what does the EU expect in, in presenting this section? Sanctions, sorry. Uh, our, our sanctions uh, aim to uh, undermine and dismantle uh, the Russian capability to uh, to wage this war in Ukraine. Um, it is a, a military objective, if you like, um, uh, through uh, unmilitary means. Um, uh, but uh, sanctions, we have uh, um, put um, about 700 uh, top officials of the Russian government uh, and others who work with and profit from the government on our blacklist. Uh, we have uh, put um, uh, sanctions on the financial system of, uh, of Russia. We are basically excluding it from, uh, from participation in the international uh, financial networks. Uh, we have uh, sanctioned uh, airlines, uh, Russian, uh, gov particularly the government-owned uh, government airlines, and uh, and put in place a, a a a ban on Russian overflights of our uh, airspace and landing rights on our airports. Uh, so um, this is a, a massive package of sanction, un unprecedented again. It's not that we like to do that, but this is absolutely necessary. It's one of the key tools that we uh, that we have in, in order to uh, uh, to stem and push back uh, the uh, the military attack of Russia against Ukraine. Okay, Ambassador. Ambassador, uh, you already said that you uh, already uh, are doing uh, diplomacy uh, before the invention. So, do you think? are still think that diplomacy is the main way to resolve this conflict? There's, there's two solutions to this conflict. And one, of course, is, uh, is uh, the, the decision uh, by President Putin uh, to cease fire and, and draw back uh, uh, the Russian troops from Ukrainian soil unconditionally. That is our bottom line. Now, we will have to convince uh, the Kremlin of, of the of this and uh, and we will persevere. Diplomatic efforts are ongoing um, as we speak. Um, there are we are told uh, and read in the reports also uh, contacts between um, Ukraine and, um, uh, and and Russia in Istanbul, uh, which is welcome. Uh, we very much hope that Russia will engage in these talks. Uh, uh, sincerely and uh, with an, a real objective to uh, to reach a uh, uh, at a minimum a ceasefire uh, and um, as well as humanitarian corridors and uh, and also of that basis after that the uh, the withdrawal of, of troops humanitarian corridors are are vital uh, you have seen uh, the images uh, coming from Ukraine of whole towns um, being encircled by uh, Russian troops, uh, cut off from the outside, no food, no water, no electricity, uh, people sheltering in, in buildings that are sometimes under attack um, uh, by uh, Russian fire, missiles and, and airplanes. Uh, so a very, very grave situation repeated attempts to evacuate um, uh, people from those um, uh, besieged uh, cities have been uh, obstructed by, by the Russian military uh, convoys, civilian convoys, uh, innocent civilians who try and flee have been shot at and killed. And so that is an absolute um, breach of any uh, humanitarian principle of, of the humanitarian law uh, that all UN members have to abide by, and they, these acts qualify as war crimes. Okay, Ambassador. Ambassador, uh, regarding the, we know, we all know that Russia gave a threat, nuclear threat in, uh, in the region. So how does the EU respond to this? 
well, we, we categorically uh, reject uh, that uh, statement and that action as utterly unacceptable, unacceptable in Europe, unacceptable anywhere. And uh, so, and we um, call on, on Russia to uh, seek uh, the way of diplomacy, of negotiation uh, to resolve uh, this, uh, this war situation. So after, after the attack of the, uh, on the police border, did uh, EU conduct the military reinforcement around the border? Uh, we did not on that particular occasion. Um, we are, as I mentioned earlier, we are not a military organization um, uh, as, as in, in itself. Um, uh, but of course, the, the, this attack happened about 10 kilometers from the Polish border. Uh, the blast could be seen, uh, could be heard uh, from Polish territory. Uh, so it just shows how real this crisis is, not just for Ukraine, Ukraine, but also for, for Europe. And it explains, I think, in very simple terms, uh, why the EU uh, is so worried and why uh, we are calling on all nations around the world uh, to isolate Russia uh, in its uh, in its uh, uh, behavior, its aggressive behavior towards uh, another uh, European country. Okay, Ambassador, uh, the next question is, Russia said uh, that Western countries made a lot of fake news about these situations. So uh, what do you think about that statement? Well, I, if we can say with certainty that the, the, the source of this information of fake news is Moscow itself. Um, if you look at how the, uh, the Russian uh, regime has legitimized uh, the, um, their military attack, um, talking about uh, uh, denazifying um, Ukraine. Well, you try to find the Nazis in Ukraine. Uh, there is a and you will, you will not succeed. Uh, there is one extreme right party, far right party, which ran in the elections, the last elections for the parliament in Ukraine. Uh, they gained 1.6% of the vote and they, needed, they did not make it to the, to the Ukrainian parliament just to show what the extent of, uh, of, of Nazi presence is in, uh, in Ukraine. It is an utter fabrication. And uh, disinformation, which is a polite word of, uh, of a lie. And uh, so the Kremlin is the source of, um, of, of disinformation in this situation, um, utilizing, of course, all the outlets they uh, have, the government owned uh, outlets. Um, the EU has uh, suspended two of these outlets, uh, uh, Sputnik and uh, Russia Today. Yeah, we have said this is not possible on the European soil to abuse our freedom of speech, freedom of press uh, for, uh, for war mongering and hence this suspe uh, suspension. Let me also uh, remind uh, um, that uh, freedom of media in Russia is non-existent these days. It was always uh, problematic. But uh, there's uh, no um, independent outlets uh, operating anymore um, unless they uh, um, uh, comply with the, uh, with the propaganda and the disinformation um, uh, dictated by the Kremlin. Uh, just yesterday, uh, one of the last um, um, independent uh, written um, media, uh, Novaya Gazeta, uh, had to announce that they had to suspend their operations because they couldn't do that job any longer. Uh, just to illustrate uh, where uh, freedom of media and the press uh, stands in Russia at the present moment. Ambassador, uh, some of EU member states are part of the G20 members. Then some of them think that Russia's membership in the G20 to be reconsidered. So how will the EU respond about that? Indeed, we have uh, five, five EU member states part of the G20, uh, plus the EU itself. The five member states are Germany, France, Italy, um, Spain, and uh, the Netherlands. Uh, so all, in all, we have six of the 20. Um, what we've said is that in the current situation, um, it can't be business as usual. Uh, uh, we in international plat platforms, we cannot deal and de have dealings with Russia in the same way as as if nothing happened. 
uh, we've said to uh, also to Indonesia that um, in the current co uh, context, we will find it very, very difficult uh, to engage uh, with Russia in the G20 context. And it's now for, uh, uh, for the Indonesian government to consider how it, uh, how it will move forward and which solution it will find. Uh, and uh, at the same day, uh, when the, about the G20s uh, issues come up, Russian ambassador in Indonesia uh, had a press conference and he said that West reaction to this to these cases are very disproportionate. So she compared the Israeli attack uh, on Gaza and the US attack on Libya, which was not sanctioned. So what is your response about his, uh, she said, her, her statement? Well, first of all, speaking for the EU, uh, uh, our um, um, peace missions abroad outside the EU are all under a UN mandate, uh, UN Security Council, and um, that is our manner of operation. Secondly, it, it is very difficult and, and often misleading uh, to compare one crisis to another, different circumstances, different situations, and one-on-one uh, -on -one comparisons are, are just uh, impossible or, or irrelevant and maybe good for the analysis afterwards for, for the historians, but not relevant for dealing with the situation right now. Because the third element is, you know, whatever happened in other parts of the world, in Syria, in Afghanistan, um, um, it, it cannot be a justification for, uh, for aggressive behavior right now. And uh, that is just not possible. Um, the justification does not exist. Threat posed no threat uh, to Russia. It was not about to attack uh, Russia. Uh, it was the other way around. Uh, it was Russia that amassed um, 150,000 uh, troops or whatever the number was um, on the border of, of Ukraine. Uh, it uh, uh, installed uh, <coughs> military hardware, missile systems, and, and the like, and, and it attacked uh, without any provocation. So that is the bottom line we have to deal with, and that is to say, uh, for to keep calling on Russia uh, to cease fire, uh, to respect the humanitarian corridors, and to uh, withdraw uh, the troops, and, and then. Uh, we can, uh, of course, uh, the two sides in uh, Ukraine and Russia uh, can and should discuss uh, the long-term solution uh, towards a sustainable peace. Uh, okay, uh, Ambassador, uh, my last question about these issues. Uh, what solution does the EU expect from this conflict and what do you want to do help Ukraine after this crisis? Well, we want a, a lasting peace uh, agreement between uh, Russia and, and Ukraine. We want Russia to honor the respect for uh, the, um, uh, the territorial integrity of Ukraine. Um, Ukraine's internationally recognized borders were recognized also by Russia uh, at the time. Uh, so there's no dispute about that at all. And we just want to uh, accept Russia to accept that fact. Um, secondly, about rebuilding uh, Ukraine, the costs are enormous. Uh, you have seen the uh, the damage, um, uh, the damage and destruction uh, caused in the in the cities, apartment buildings, small houses, uh, hospitals, schools, uh, bridges, airports, everything. Uh, so we have no clue what it is going to cost. However. Uh, the EU in its um, uh, summit of, uh, of last Friday uh, has said we will help Ukraine, we will um, uh, raise funding ourselves and we will set up an international fund uh, uh, for also other countries to, uh, to come in uh, for uh, the reconstruction of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine society, uh, uh, housing, social infrastructure, uh, plants, uh, factories, etc. as soon as the war is over. Okay, Ambassador, now we move to the relationship about Indonesia and 
EU. So how is the current Indonesia and EU relationships now? Well, uh, uh, we, are, we are very uh, uh, pleased with uh, how the relations are, are developing. For us, Indonesia is a, is a major, major partner in Southeast Asia, in fact, in Asia. Um, you will have heard of the, uh, the EU's new strategy for the cooperation with countries in the Indo-Pacific. And um, in it, uh, you will see um, a feature of Indonesia, uh, as well as ASEAN, by the way, um, uh, as, a, as a major partner. So uh, we have um, a number of very important topics on our agenda. First of all, our free trade uh, negotiations. Um, almost halfway, let's say, uh, in the negotiation track. And we hope that we can bring them to a solution uh, soon. Um, we know that this is good for both economies, but especially for the Indonesian uh, economy. It's good for your trade. It's good for European investment here. And it is good for Indonesian uh, jobs. Um, the second big topic is, without a doubt, uh, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the global uh, climate crisis. Uh, we haven't <laughs> uh, heard, uh, spoken about it a lot in the past four weeks, but, uh, but it is there and uh, we need to cooperate very, very closely with uh, together as Europe and Indonesia uh, to, to combine forces and, and to uh, uh, develop common approaches, uh, stimulate uh, renewable energy uh, development in, uh, in your country and uh, to jointly work on the forest, of course, and uh, on the, um, uh, the greening of the uh, economy as a whole. So that's a very big and, and tough agenda um, ahead, but we are, we are ready for it. And we do expect, uh, also helped by um, Indonesia's G20 uh, presidency, um, we can bring in a number of uh, top level um, uh, interlocutors, our presidents will, will come to Indonesia, uh, our ministers and uh, EU um, uh, commissioners, uh, minister equivalent, uh, to uh, strike new um, cooperation agreements with uh, between uh, European Union and, uh, and Indonesia. Indonesia and EU has always been concerned about the palm oil regulations. So, uh, and most recently, the European Union implemented a deforestation free product rules. And what is your opinion, opinion about uh, this and what solutions will uh, EU provide to Indonesia regarding this issue? First of all, on uh, palm oil, let me make very clear that we have no um, dispute about palm oil in general. Uh, we, ha we have at the present moment a dispute about um, um, biodiesel made with palm oil. And uh, now the, the good news, if you like, is that uh, we are not quarreling about that. We, are, uh, we have taken, Indonesia has taken this um, dispute to the WTO uh, dispute settlement procedure. Uh, so both sides have made their case. Uh, there and we just now need to wait for the for the ruling and as uh, loyal WTO members, the EU will always implement uh, what comes out of uh, the dispute uh, settlement. Um, secondly, um, the um, our new proposal, uh, um, the EU Commission, uh, our executive branch of government in the EU uh, proposed this uh, new legislation for deforestation free products um, the uh, regulation is i think going to be very workable uh, for indonesia uh, because um, the deforestation rates in, in your country have gone down uh, tremendously over the past uh, couple of years it's not yet perfect but uh, we are very much seeing the trend in a very uh, good uh, direction and it means that we expect um, that, reasonably speaking, um, um, crops like, like palm oil and, and timber uh, from Indonesia will be able uh, to meet um, uh, the standards for the uh, uh, European market. Uh, it's, it's not yet an unfinished business, but um, we, uh, we are quite, quite hopeful. Just last week, um, to illustrate, we have uh, 
uh, we had uh, very intensive and good discussions uh, at senior level between your government and, and, uh, and, and the European Commission. Um, and in 10 days from now, we also expect uh, our minister rank uh, commissioner for the environment uh, to visit uh, Indonesia uh, to pursue uh, the same discussions also with, with the in at governmental level uh, with the ministers uh, uh, in, uh, of Indonesia dealing with, with these topics. So I think we're in a good dialogue mode. Uh, some hard work still, still to be done, uh, but uh, I'm quite optimistic. Okay, Ambassador, uh, as you know that uh, Indonesia wants to be, uh, want to have uh, capital, new capital city. So is there any discussion about cooperation or investment with you there? Um, we, of course, fun, a fantastic project. And uh, we have, um, we we're following this with, with great interest, uh, of course, also because it, uh, it may mean that uh, myself and my mission uh, will may be moving to, uh, um, to uh, East Kalimantan before too long. Um, but leaving that aside, side, uh, we were keenly um, uh, interested in, in the opportunities for cooperation there. Uh, President uh, Vidodo has said he wants uh, Nusantara to be uh, a smart and green um, capital. And uh, now there's plenty of know-how in that area uh, available in, in, in the EU. We have some extremely well-run um, capital cities or uh, provincial capitals uh, throughout Europe. And so I, I'm 100% sure that we can um, bring something uh, to Indonesia for the, um, for the formation, for the uh, development of your new capital. And it's, it's quite exciting. Okay, so, oh, uh, and you know that uh, Indonesia now uh, as a chair of G20, so is there any suggestions from EU uh, about this? about the Indonesia uh, presidency? Oh, well, certainly. Um, I mean, we are um, very, very supportive of, uh, of Indonesia's uh, presidency. It's, it's the first time ever that Indonesia has this role. So it's a great opportunity for Indonesia to profile itself on the, on the world stage. Um, we support topics uh, that Indonesia has put on the agenda on the, uh, the global health side, on the global recovery and uh, the global energy transition. Uh, these are top priorities for the world, but also for, for the EU. So I think we'll be able to make a, a very good uh, uh, contribution to, to, to this um, uh, at all levels, at it's, it's, it's the official level, but also at the political level. And we look forward to that. Okay, Ambassador, so the last, last question from me, uh, what do you expect from the relations with Indonesia and what kind of cooperation do you want to develop and strengthen with Indonesia in the future? <laughs> you know, uh, this is a massive country, uh, geographically and uh, population-wise, and um, uh, its economy is, is, is among the top 20 of the world already. And in, let's say, 20 years from now, um, it will be in the top 10 or whatever, uh, but it will be a, a tremendously important economy. Uh, so uh, there is a, a huge interest of ours to, to work with Indonesia to not only uh, boost your GDP, but also to uh, make, make sure that we work on sustainability and on sustainable growth, sustainable consumption, by everybody, by you, by me. Um, uh, and uh, th those are the, the big ticket topics uh, for, for us. And, and we look forward to, uh, uh, to Indonesia uh, continuing its role on the, on the, on the world stage. Uh, today, it's, uh, this year, it's the G20. Next year, it's the ASEAN chair. And, um, uh, but also looking beyond that in its own right, um, we see Indonesia as a like-minded country. Uh, we look at global problems by and large in the, in the same way, from the same angles, and we support the same objectives. So I think that there's plenty of ground for cooperation in, in many, many fields, um, domestically, but also internationally. Ya, demikian tadi kita sudah menyaksikan wawancara jurnalismedcom.id Marseilla, dan terima kasih untuk... Pemirsa Newsmaker, kita akan berjumpa pekan depan dengan topik dan narasumber menarik lainnya. Saya Alfa Mandalika pamit, sampai jumpa.
Medcom.id, a part of Media Group Network.